years, the video game landscape was dominated by Italian plumbers and blue hedgehogs, serving as mascots for their respective platforms. And while many tried, few characters matched them in popularity. It wasn't until the 32-bit era when a small development team named Core Designs began work on an action game for the Sega Saturn, PlayStation, and PC that gaming's traditional mascots would face a challenge from a globe-trotting treasure hunter by the name of Lara Croft. Initially, when I pitched the idea for the game, uh, it, was, it was a male character. We were playing with the idea of having more than one character. So I designed a male and a female character, and then I realized pretty much that the amount of story I wanted to stick in was going to require us to have uh, like double the cutscenes. And so I had to ditch one, and by that point I'd already kind of completely fallen for the uh, female character, and that was how Lara became the, the star. The game was so good, I don't think it would have mattered who I was playing as, you know, I could have been a guy, I could have been an alien, I could have been a robot, I, I, it just didn't matter to me. Being a teenage guy at the time, I was definitely intrigued by uh, the game starring a woman. Part of the reason why she uh, was so popular when she, was, when she first appeared is because she was the opposite of what everyone's expectations were. She was designed almost in total opposition of what were the given norms for, um, for making her a lead character for a game. She's this uh, kind of tough uh, female hero which you didn't see much of in games at the time. You still don't but more so perhaps today than you did then. An action hero looking hot chick that people outside of the gaming industry, you know, maybe people who aren't really into games can latch on to. There were arguments raised or comments made that Lara Croft was just this sort of sex symbol that didn't really have much substance. I guess for some people that was a really big deal at the time, but for me all I, all I really cared about was just that it, it was a really great game. Developing a new character is hard enough as it is, but Core Design was also faced with the challenge of creating a full 3D action adventure game in an era where there are no proven formulas on a console outside of the Nintendo 64 and its flagship game, Super Mario 64. It was very difficult to actually get it made in the first place. I had to pitch it multiple times because very few people believed it could even be done and most people didn't want to go near it, like the developers there, because they were frightened of, of, um, of making this 3D game, with 3D character. I mean, Core had never done that before. It's weird to think about that being kind of anything special now because all games are in 3D, but, you know, prior to that game, I think the only kind of really impressive 3D game that I'd played was probably uh, was probably uh, Mario 64. But the thing that Tomb Raider did that Mario didn't was that it also had all these really detailed textures and you know a somewhat realistic environment where you know which Mario never aspired to. Upon its release in 1996 on the Sega Saturn and Sony PlayStation, Tomb Raider became an instant success with its mixture of gunplay and puzzle solving. I think Tomb Raider really deserved the level of um, kind of acclaim and just, just hype and discussion that it generated because a lot of games had exploration as a major element, you know, even stuff like Zelda where you're going through dungeons and things like that, but what made Tomb Raider feel really different was the really physical way that your character, Lara Croft, interacted with the environment and needed to jump and climb and navigate the environment. And also just that she herself was this kind of tough, strong, female Indiana Jones type fortune hunter or treasure hunter as she was presented in the original Tomb Raider. It took me a while to sort of learn the visual language of like where can Laura jump? Because, you know, she couldn't just run and jump willy nilly. There were certain spots she could sort of mantle up and whatnot. And so it took me a little while to sort of get my mind adjusted to moving through that space and how she worked as a game character and how the space determined the gameplay. It was one of the first games that I ever convinced my kind of colleagues at the time to let me take home. So I borrowed like a, a debug PlayStation 1 and took it home, invited a bunch of my friends over who were you know, super excited to be playing a game before it was out. My first exposure to Tomb Raider happened at a friend's house actually sitting on the second floor hallway. His mom had moved the TV and the system into the hallway because he was playing it too much in his room. We were all in, in college at the time and uh, somehow you know, we wound up with a copy of Tomb Raider and the game just immediately 
captured our interest. So we sat there in the hallway and I watched as he hogged the controller and played Tomb Raider on the PS1. I remember we were especially impressed about uh, the way you could swim, you know, you could dive in and swim underwater and stuff like that. That was something we hadn't really seen. You fight a T-Rex, which at the time was really kind of traumatizing to me. Seeing this huge, monstrous creature, it made Lara seem so tiny, and her little dual-wielded pistols, which were a really cool weapon, made them feel almost like ineffective against this just massive creature. It really kind of shook me up. It was unlike anything I'd ever seen before. It was really cool, really cool. It didn't disappoint. It was, uh, you know, it really was unlike anything else that we'd played at the time. I only play for sport. Its star had become an icon for an entirely new audience of video game fans mesmerized by the adventures of Lara Croft as her face appeared on everything from magazines and television shows that would otherwise not have given video games a second thought. On the one hand, you look at her and you think, uh, look at those proportions like what kind of female you know hero is this to to aspire to this is unrealistic um but on the other hand laura croft goes into the situation she's not defending herself with like the twirl of a parasol or by you know pushing her arms together and blowing a kiss She's shooting a tiger in the face. The original Tomb Raider's popularity catapulted the series and its developer, Core Design, into the spotlight. I, I guess I always believed it was going to do really well. I mean, I, I was convinced that we were making a good, a, a good game. I mean, a lot of the ways that the game was designed were sort of based on what were already classic games. Um, and it was really just mixing those together with a new twist. And that was, that was what Tomb Raider was. More importantly, it also helped solidify the PlayStation's position as a dominant console platform. Not just from a consumer standpoint, but also from a developer point of view. The PlayStation version of Tomb Raider was much easier for the team to create as opposed to the Sega Saturn version, which proved difficult due to its complicated architecture. The Saturn was eventually dropped as a viable platform for the series, so Core could focus its attention on just two platforms, PlayStation and PC, for the inevitable sequel. Tomb Raider 2 arrived in late 1997, and like its predecessor, was a huge success. In fact, it was so popular that Tomb Raider 2 sales quickly surpassed those of the original game, thanks in large part to some refined controls and more varied environments. I think that Tomb Raider 2 kind of improved on the original by making better use of, um, of various locations around the world. It just gave the game more of a Indiana Jones globe hopping adventure flavor. It was a really difficult game and it's the kind of game where it didn't give you many clues as to always where to go and what to do. The gameplay you know wasn't drastically different but I, it felt different because the game felt so sort of somehow a lot less organic. You went to Venice and and other you know exotic Kind of locales. Instead of jumping around in caves and underground tombs and you know waterfalls and stuff, I think there were levels in you know just inside large buildings and you know instead of rocky outcrops, maybe you're hanging from chandeliers and that kind of thing. There's one level in particular that I think anyone who's played Tomb Raider 2 probably remembers, and that's this huge um, opera house. Um, that just has the craziest, most unlikely architecture of any opera house, you know, in the world. Once again, Lara took center stage and continued serving as a mascot for a new generation of games. By the time the third Tomb Raider game was released, some cracks showed in the franchise's foundation that each successive game was nearly identical to the last outside of the story and locations involved. The two following games, Tomb Raider The Last Revelation and Tomb Raider Chronicles received similar criticism, but even despite Tomb Raider fatigue setting in, the series still remained popular. For the sixth game in the series, Core wanted to breathe new life into the franchise by not only incorporating popular elements from other action adventure games at the time, but also a much richer story. As a result, Tomb Raider Angel of Darkness was born. And while the game received some positive reaction for attempting to bring the Tomb Raider formula up to date, the game sadly still shared many of the control problems of its predecessor. You know, if I remember rightly, Angel of the Darkness was the first one where I kind of felt like the Lara Croft phenomenon had got out of control. You know, I remember receiving a press release from Core Design in the UK and 
the big kind of selling point for this press release, the thing they're trying to draw attention to, was just the fact that Lara had a bunch of new outfits. This is really not practical adventuring gear. Which made her kind of seem like a Barbie doll. For a little while, it seemed like like her chest was just getting bigger and bigger with each subsequent game. That kind of, I think, made it hard to appreciate her as a strong, heroic type because it seemed like the developers were presenting her more as just this um, sex object. Laura wasn't always this curvy. She uh, used to be a little bit more sharply contoured, I guess. Angel of Darkness ultimately failed to reinvigorate the franchise and Cora was eventually disbanded. I was really kind of surprised when core design went under because it just you know with the success of the, the first tomb raider and you know things like lara croft appearing on the cover of major magazines and stuff it really just seemed like they would be untouchable it would almost be akin to hearing right now or five years from now hearing that bungie's going under or something like it just you just don't expect it however recognizing that the tomb raider name still carried some weight idos Tomb Raider's publisher handed development duties for new Tomb Raider games to Crystal Dynamics, whose previous work included Soul Reaver series. The Tomb Raider series was had a bit of a tarnish on it. It wasn't sort of this paragon of, you know, genre-defining 3D gameplay anymore. That series definitely needed somebody, like anybody, to offer a kind of fresh take on it. After an extended break, Tomb Raider returned with the Crystal Dynamics developed Tomb Raider Legend which successfully brought the series back from the brink of extinction. The point where I started getting back into Tomb Raider and being excited by Tomb Raider again was when Legend came out. It was sort of a concerted effort to get back to the roots, present it in current generation graphics. Same concepts from the classic Tomb Raider games, but um, finally kind of advanced and modernized after having played Prince of Persia. I was hoping, you know, to be able to do maybe not yeah, well, yeah, similarly acrobatic stuff in beautiful places, and I wasn't disappointed. While that game definitely had a pretty good amount of action in it, I think they did also offer like some really great puzzles and stuff, which was very reminiscent of the, the first couple of games. Crystal Dynamics will continue its work on Tomb Raider with two more games in the series, Tomb Raider Anniversary and Tomb Raider Underworld, both of which were met with some high praise from fans and critics alike. It just seemed like the time was right and we had all this technology from Legend that was ready to go and it just seemed like uh, things coming together and the timing was just right to, to go and roll straight through. We also uh, wanted to show people maybe who had never played Tomb Raider 1 what got people interested in this franchise in the first place and what, what people thought was so special about Lara Croft. The Tomb Raider series may not be as popular as it once was, but the series has made a strong comeback over recent years as it continues to evolve and find a place for itself. Really? Indeed, even the upcoming Tomb Raider serves as yet another reboot of sorts, putting players in the role of a much younger Lara Croft in a game that features a much darker tone. I think that Lara is a charismatic enough character that fans of the series will will want to kind of see her succeed and will, if the games are good, if, if this Tomb Raider reboot is, is actually a, a good, you know, solid game, that those who, who may, may have kind of drifted from the series, like I've done, because it maybe didn't always feel fresh and new and exciting, I think that a lot of those people will um, come kind of gravitating back I think fans will always be interested to see what Lara Croft does. I mean, just like fans are always interested to see what Mario does. Um, she's sort of on that level of video game icon. And Tomb Raider's been such a big part of my kind of gaming life now for, you know, many years that I, I really can't help myself. But for all of its hits and misses, Tomb Raider remains as one of the most important game franchises in the annals of video game history.